Welcome to the Foster Friendly Podcast, where we come together to make a difference in the lives of children in foster care and the families who care for them. Foster Friendly Communities are part of a nationwide movement by America's Kids Belong that helps people from all walks of life take action and help kids and families thrive. You'll hear from former foster youth, foster and adoptive parents, social workers, faith and business leaders, and other experts on how to engage in meaningful ways. Our hosts, Brian, Travis, and Courtney, explore inspiring stories of everyday people making a difference in foster care where they live and work. Welcome to another episode of the Foster Friendly Podcast. I'm Travis, and I'm in South Carolina, and I'm joined by my co-host, Courtney, in Colorado. Our special guest today is in Virginia, so we're kind of across the country here. Today, we're going to be talking with an adoptive dad who's become a big voice and influence in the space of foster care and adoption awareness. He's going to share his story and lessons he's learned along the way, as well as what inspires him to motivate others to engage foster care and adoption. This is also a unique episode as well, because the three of us on this represent transracial adoptive families. That's really cool. So a little bit more about Barry. Barry Farmer lives in Richmond, Virginia, with his three adopted sons. He grew up in kinship care with his grandmother from ages 5 to 18. At age 20, Barry became a foster father with a local therapeutic agency to further help youth within his community. And then at age 22, he adopted his oldest son. Today, as a single father, Barry is a spokesperson for Adopt Us Kids, foster care adoption advocate for children awaiting adoption, speaker, mentor, host of the Barry Farmer Morning Show with Sharon Lizzie, a nationally syndicated radio show based out of Richmond, Virginia, and the Foster Care and Adoption Life Talk web series, as well as the creator, administrator of the largest online support group for one of the largest online support groups for foster care and adoptive families. That is a lot. Really excited for this podcast. Welcome to the podcast, Barry. Oh, thank you so much for having me. Thank you for the invite. I'm excited to talk to you guys and spread this word of advocating that I like to do for our older children and adoption and foster care, I should say. Awesome. That's awesome. Yeah, we're so glad to have you. Yeah, as we launch this, can you just tell us more about you and your family and even what you like to do for fun? Well, more about me. Uh, let's see. Who am I? Of course, you know, I host a radio show based out of Richmond, Virginia. But overall, I'm just a fun guy, I believe. I don't know what the kids think, but adults <laughs> think, tend to think I'm fun. <laughs> well, then I think they'll think you're fun, too. Though. Yeah. <laughs> um, you know, I like to laugh. I like to eat. Oh, you can't see me because it's really from the neck down. But... <laughs> <laughs> you know, I, I just enjoy um, having a good laugh, you know, even when times are tough. I, you know, mm. tell my, even tell my sons, like, find a reason to laugh today or something that makes you just bust mm. a gut, you know, even when times are hard. So I like that. Uh, the fa My family, of course, everyone knows I, I have a translational adoptive family that we built one by one, kid by kid. People tend to think that the boys are all three biologically related, but nobody in the house is biologically related, even, you know. Um, mm. You know, going viral with the makeup of our family because it was kind of unheard of, especially with social media mm. around, you know, people weren't used to seeing uh, African-Americans with white kids as mm -hmm. family members, as adoptive family members and things like that. And, you know, it, it shined a light that we do adopt as African Americans and that we that I single people do adopt um, multiple kids mm. and that you know we all can learn something from each other living in a home from different backgrounds. Mm. Well said. Yeah. Yeah. So obviously fostering and adopting is part of your heart, part of your life. Mm -hmm. Tell us more about your fostering and your adoption journey. Uh it was unexpected. I'm going to start there. Like when I prefer, when I first became a foster parent, uh, from my understanding at the time that, you know, the kids come for a little while, they go home, you know, be reunited with their families. And I was okay with that. You know, it was something I thought I needed to do, something I wanted to do, something that I wanted to take very seriously when doing it. Um, even at my young age of 20 being licensed and, you know, people, my uh, director, I should say, she was very upfront with me during the process. She said, well, nobody's looking for a single male to foster kids at the age of 20. And it's <laughs> going to be a while. 
And I was like, I'm in, I'm in no rush, you know. <laughs> I want to uh, be available and to um, open my home for it. And it, everything just seemed to fall in place for me to do it. Um, when I picked up this employment guy that was they used to have around town, I was really looking to be a truck driver. I really wanted to drive seats, you know, <laughs> track the trailers across the country and whatnot. But I saw this ad that said, um, become a foster parent today. Ages 18 and up are welcome. I was like, really? Wow. Okay. Hmm. <laughs> so, I was, Let's test this and see if they mean it. Because I, I was um, 19 at the time going on 20 hmm. when I first did the interview and whatnot. And I had a great conversation about my upbringing with the director of the program. And before you knew it, she had asked me how old I was. And I still looked rather old back then. I still looked about, I was 30, like when I was 19 or 20. <laughs> so <laughs> when I told her that I was 20, she was kind of shocked. And she was like, but I feel like you can do this. I feel like mm. you can do this. And I was like, well, you know, I already worked in child care. I've been working in child care for about five years at that point. I worked at a child care center when I interviewed there, working with the younger kids and helping run the before and after school program for the child care center. So, you know, and we had foster kids come through that um, center as well. So that kind of gave me a, a glimpse of what these parents would be dealing with on a daily basis. Hmm. Um, so when she uh, licensed me, I was like, okay, well, now I got to find somewhere to live because I was living <laughs> in a one-bedroom apartment. And she was like, I can't complete the license until you move. And I was like, I'm going to move. And it so happened I used to do a, um, a lot of um, yard work for my old elementary school art teacher. And we were catching up in her kitchen. And I was telling her my plans to move and, you know, finish my license to become a foster parent. And she was like, oh, my goodness, wow. But then she, I left and she called me like 30 minutes later and she was like, well, I don't know why I didn't think of this, but I have a place you can rent and you can pay, pay the same rent you're paying now for a bigger place. And I was like, shut up, because back then <laughs> rent was like $400. I was like, oh my God, I get a two-bedroom for $400. <laughs> Let's go. <laughs> That's a deal. So, you know, <laughs> everything just seemed to fall into place. And I, I know I've always been a believer in things happen in the order in which they should. Mm. So, you know, falling, I, it's got, like I fell into foster care. And then um, having my oldest son who came, he was my second placement. Uh, it's kind of like I fell into having a son because it just was one day that they were like, well, he can't go back home. And would you consider adopting him? And when they asked me what I consider, I'm like, y'all, y'all forget I was 22? You sure? Yeah. <laughs> but, <laughs> right. And, you know. <laughs> I didn't think they were serious. I, I was serious when I was like, yeah, I would consider it. And I didn't really think that I would be an option once they told him that he wasn't going back home. I was like, well, mm. he's going to leave now. And I was going to really miss him anyway. You know, we had bonded over that time where before he knew he wasn't going back. And I, you know, I never, I didn't know how much I liked him until he was gone. He left for like a weekend to go somewhere else and try a family. And then he came back. And I was like, I really miss this kid. I really love this kid. <laughs> and, he, and he really missed me, too. He was ready to go as soon as he got there, wherever he went. And I was like, <laughs> okay, I think I'm a legit father right now. I want to adopt this kid. Wow. That is cool. It, like, culminated then in that moment of just, <laughs> like, a mutual, this is a fit. Yeah. yeah. I love yeah. that. You know, I was going to ask you too, like how much of the, a little bit of the inspiration or kind of the desire to do this stemmed at all from you yourself kind of being in kinship care growing up? I mean, mm -hmm. did that kind of have a bearing as well a little bit or? Uh, absolutely. So I grew up in kinship care, which is another form of foster care. And for, it felt just like foster care because uh, my grandmother, Cora, was the one that came to um, step in and take me home. And I didn't know her from a pan of can you know, anywhere. Mm. I, we, we didn't really have uh, a relationship at all. I mean, I don't even remember meeting mm. this woman until mm. she showed up one day. <laughs> wow. <laughs> and I was like, who is this? And what are y'all trying to do here <laughs> right now? Right. I was living with my aunt. And my aunt was on a mission to get my sisters out of foster care. And 
same genders can't share a bedroom or a bed. So in order for them to come with her, I had to leave. Mm. And my, my, my aunt is actually my mother's sister. So she reached out to my grandmother, who is my father's mother. And she was like, you know, Miss Cora, I have your, your grandson here. I'm trying to get his sisters. Would you consider, you know, taking him in with you so I can get his sisters? And she was like, yeah. And my grandmother was an empty nester. Like, she hadn't had kids in years. Uh-huh. <laughs> like, years. Hmm. So for her to, you know, step back into parenthood after such a long time. And, you know, it's almost starting, starting completely over. Because that was like four going on five at the time. And hmm. I was, and when I think about it, like, she did not have to do it, you know. Sure. It could have been, no, you keep them, and then y'all had to figure out how to get the girls on your own type of thing. But she was like, yeah, I would do it. And I, my aunt had to promise me she would see me before I went because I was not happy <laughs> about the situation. Mm. And my aunt told me, she was like, if you go, I promise you I will come and get you every weekend if you go. Mm. And... I guess it was like a little more convincing and I did, you know, and I went and my aunt came and picked me up every weekend for five years straight until I was wow. like on my own, having friends in the neighborhood, going different places. She got to my grandmother's house every weekend to pick me up with my sisters and we would go back to her house for the weekend. Committed. Mm. Yeah. Yes, committed. Yeah. And that's how I learned to like keep promises. Like, my sons will tell you I've never broke a promise to them. If I say, I promise you this is going to happen, you need to believe that it's going to happen. Mm. And I wow. learned that from my aunt. Yeah. That's very cool. Yeah. <clears throat> Are you still fostering today? Oh, no. I'm okay. retired. Oh, no. I'm retired, <laughs> guys. <laughs> Done your time. Good to know. I am retired. I think after my last adoption, then I did it, I had a kinship placement with, um, my godsons. So I was up to like five boys in the home at one time by myself. <laughs> so mm. I was like, okay, um, yeah, we're going to shut that on down. And we're just going to have these kids right here because this is a lot. But I enjoyed having them with me too, you know, with my boys because all of them thought of each other as brothers anyway. Mm. So, you know, it was, it was just a house full of guys. It's like a little mini miniature frat house or something. <laughs> 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 so just, just playing video games and farting and ew, ew, you know, all that stuff. So, I got um, that. Yep. You know, with that, I I cannot say I don't miss it, but even with my health right now, like mm-hmm. I'm suffering from heart failure right now. Mm-hmm. So I don't think for me that would be a good place to be at the moment. I have to yeah, I'm really getting back to focusing on myself, really, because of two, my two of my older sons, they have moved on to move out the house, and I'm left with, I'm back to one, which I am really enjoying. Mm. Right? Yeah. <laughs> I'm really enjoying it. And, <laughs> you know, and hopefully to be an empty nester by 42, which is going to be amazing. <laughs> <laughs> amazing. So, uh. yeah, I, I, I like the advocacy part of it because it still lets me be involved. It still lets me share my experience to help others try to figure things out. I mean, mm. I've helped friends figure things out to become foster parents and adoptive uh, parents from foster care. Right? They come to my home and sit mm. and chat and they look at the boys and we talk about the possibilities of yeah. you know, what adoption and foster care looks like in the home mm. and why, you know, certain things will play out the way they will. Sure. Well, you know, in your interview with today, you said about one of your earliest foster placements who would go on to become your son. And this is your, your quote, this child in my head is black. When I got there, he was just the whitest white child that I ever worked with. I thought, wow, is this going to be interesting because I have no clue what I'm doing. I laughed out loud when I read that, partly because I I love the the realness and the honesty there. Yeah. And again, back to you know, this is a unique episode where the three of us kind of kind of experience and, and kind of talk about that um, cross 
racial lines of, of adoption. Mm-hmm. So, um, and in fact, when I look at my story, uh, we have Norwegian ancestry. I've got a great grandpa called Ingvald and then my son, Dre. So I got to be the first family tree that's got an Ingvald and a Dre on the same family <laughs> tree. <laughs> but anyway, uh, more into your story. What, what has been your experience with transracial adoption, both the beautiful and kind of some of the challenging? Um, the challenge was being afraid to mess up. Like when I say I had never worked with a white child before until I met my son at that table, I I was used to working in the inner city, African American children all day, every day. Even the child care center I was at, there were no white no white kids there. So mm. it was really outside of my comfort zone. Um, when I even when I applied to be a foster parent, I didn't checked a box that says only black kids. I mm-hmm. I left all of them open. I was like, I'm open to everything, you know, because mm. I feel like it would be a learning experience for the both of us. <laughs> anyway. mm-hmm. And, you know, the challenge was, I, you know, I was really, really scared that I would just, like, I hope I don't damage this kid emotionally in any type of place or anything like that. Mm. And then, you know, there was like cultural differences, like getting a haircut, Oh, that was a time. <laughs> because I, he, I I tried to avoid that part until one day we went to go do laundry. It was just me and him. And he rode past the window of the laundromat. And I caught a glimpse of his head. And he had cut his bangs. And it was not good. And I was like, man, we got, we got to go to the barbershop. And I got to figure out what to say to them when I get there. Because... As an African American at the time, I had like a low cut, and I would I can go in, I can go in and I can, you know, just sit in a chair and say, "Give me an even," and they'll know exactly what I'm talking about. Mm. And I go to supercuts with the kid, and they're like, well, "Do you <laughs> do you want the three centim- three inches off the side, something on the top? How much?" I was like, "Lady." <laughs> <laughs> I pulled out a picture of Justin Bieber. I said, make him look like this. <laughs> <laughs> make him look like this. That's hilarious. Oh, man. That is too funny. That is funny. And it, it's funny. It's eye-opening to me, too, because I don't think of that side of it. You know, I think yeah. as, a, as a white mom to black yeah. boys and girls, I think about the hair stuff a lot. <laughs> you know, it's so different. But I, I have never thought about the other way around, how different it is for you as well. Yeah. Yeah, it was, I, I had no clue what to say. And mm. I had just started working, like, with a colleague that was white, because I never really worked with colleagues that were white before. And I had to ask them, I was like, so when you go, <laughs> and it was a female, I said, do you say, what do I say? Because I want him to look like that for a little while. And she, would, and she told me exactly what to say. And I said, okay, moving on. What about clothes? Because I don't want him walking around, you know, looking like me per se. I want him to fit the culture with whatever it's supposed to be. Well you you should go to Once Upon a Child and da 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 I said, okay. I've seen, <laughs> I've seen that store before I never stepped foot in there. <laughs> but, <laughs> right. You know, it was it was asking questions. I wanted to make sure that he was comfortable from where he, wherever he came from. He came from a white family. He was placed with a white white family with me. So, mm. you know, I just wanted to make sure I continue to have them connected that way. Any way that will make them feel comfortable. Mm. Now, I'm not going to lie. I burnt them a few times at the beach to get the sunscreen. <laughs> that's a new thing. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> like, yeah. I, I, oh, yeah, that's right. You need sunscreen because he, really, <laughs> he was a really pale little fellow. And I was like, oh, yeah. Geez. So, you know. Those were learning curves for the both of us. He definitely reminded me from then on because he it was really bad. I was kind of scared. <laughs> was, holy smoke. Because I, I didn't understand until so one day we were walking in the store and I touched his shoulder. I come this way and he fell out. He was like, Daddy, no. He fell out. <laughs> I was like, oh, I'm so sorry. I didn't know it still hurt. So, oh, man. You know, those, those type of things, yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah, that's yeah. gosh, like you're saying, Courtney, from the other side that we as you know, white people don't think of those things that you would then face then being an African American guy within a white son. Mm-hmm. Um, I was going to ask you too, like, so I've got, you know, a friend, 
a couple that are African American friends of ours that have fostered. And, you know, I just know that when they've had white children out in the community with them and stuff like that, like, because that's not the, I mean, I think as white people, it's common for others to say, oh, you have African American kids with us. Well, they're foster parents or mm -hmm. whatever. But maybe from your experience, that's been a little different. I know it certainly has been for my friends of like, even just people looking differently at that or whatever. Um, in a, in a good way, in a challenging way as well of like, this is breaking misconceptions and stereotypes. Yeah. Um, well, you know, I have our friend, my friends too, that are fellow influencers and whatnot. And they, you know, I hear them tell their stories about being stopped or having the police called on them and things like that. Mm -hmm. And I take a step back. I'm like, I'm glad that never happened to me because yeah. I don't think I'm going to handle it too well. <laughs> sure. Yeah. Yeah. I, you know, and um, I don't think my sons would handle it too well either. They don't they don't play about me. So if you're trying to take them away from me, you are going to have hell from four people coming from all the directions that you wanted. Because you need to mind your business. Yeah. <laughs> and and th and that's so honest and real. And I think that even showcases a little bit when we look at where we're at in this country with race and mm -hmm. and making progress towards kind of these spaces that like that's a space that certainly has catching up to do for the public eye where it's like, and you know, that's, I'm, yeah. I'm really surprised it's never happened to me. I think it was only one time I was worried about it happening was when we um, were invited by, I believe it was Disney to come to California. And none of us had never rode a plane before. This was an experience for all of us to travel very far away from home and have this experience. But I was like, if I walk through this airport, and somebody try to play with me. <laughs> yeah, it was gonna be not going a good. A whole different news story right now. So you know, <laughs> yeah. I was really surprised. We made it all the way there. We made it all the way back home. Nobody bothered us. Nobody mm -hmm. bothers us here. Nobody's ever stopped us here and said, "Hey, are you okay?" Yeah. Is, yeah. Is, is, do you know him? You know, nobody. Right. Ever. Sure. Yeah, we get a lot of questions. I mean, we're we have Hispanic kids, black kids, white mm -hmm. kids, and a big family. But <laughs> um the funniest thing for me is my oldest, he's black, he's adopted from Ethiopia, he's twenty two. Okay. And I was just visiting him in South Carolina and our waitress asked if we were if I was his girlfriend. So and we've we've gone that quite a bit. I'm like, yeah. Okay, I still got it a little bit. I'm forty years old. <laughs> I still got it a little Take that as a compliment. Yeah. It cracks me up every time. Um well, shifting topics a little bit, you talked about being an advocate and what led you to becoming that advocate and really being outspoken and a proponent for fostering and adoption? Well, I kind of stumbled upon that too. Um, what had happened the first go around with the media is one of the workers for my sons came and she was like, you know, people need to hear from you because I've talked to you a lot and, you know, and your family, I want to tell you now, it's very unique. Because we were sitting, you know, by the time the media got their hands on us, we had already been a family for at least six years, minding our business and, you know, just living everyday life. And so that one local news story turns into this big thing. And what I'm talking about is foster care, the joys of foster care, the joys of being a father, adopting older children from foster care, you know, and just just a little short excerpt of shining the light on something. Of course, everybody sees the picture and they're like, well, how did this happen? That type of thing, you know? And, and I'm like, well, this is really about children in general. You know, we're talking about, you know, when you think about foster care adoption and how it's done and how it somewhat has to be done, we have children on TV begging for families. In America. Hmm. Why do we have that? You know? Why why must a child strip away their what is vulnerable to them, which is their privacy, and say, Hey, I'm just looking for another chance to have a family. And I was like, Well, what if people like you and me and we just try to speak for them? Because then they really can't articulate they're going to end up saying things that they think people want to hear in order to grab their attention. And they're shy and they, they're trying to be open, but they don't know exactly the right words to say type of thing. 
So that's why like, I feel like I, I come in, I'm like, hey, this is why you should do it. Because John can't speak the words that he wants to speak because he's so distracted by life right now and wondering what's going to happen from day to day and why this is happening and where, where is it? Why doesn't this person want me? Why does this person keep coming to see me, but then they don't come back anymore type of thing. And they need people to speak on their behalf to say, uh, they probably will be okay in your home. You just need to give them an opportunity to show you that you can't be scared of what may happen until you give them an opportunity to see what happens. And that's when I feel like when I do things like this and do things like um, other media sources and whatnot, even on my own radio show, you know, doing advocacy, we partner with Virginia Kids Belong to cool. put the voices of the children on the radio. So, you know, you, know, you get to see them but you did mm-hmm. get to hear them during the um, National Foster Care Month. Mm-hmm. So, you know, I think being an advocate, it kind of helps give them the words that they can say themselves. I love that. And, you know, some people don't, probably don't recognize if you look at America's Kids Belongs logo, mm-hmm. it's actually a person, a kid in the middle, and it has these call-outs, speech mm-hmm. bubbles of, mm-hmm. that's our, that is our passion is to let their voices be heard and share those voices that are, unheard and right. really just waiting for those families or mm-hmm. waiting in foster care, or struggling in their situations. Right. Because yeah. the way I explain it, you're, you're talking about individuals. <clears throat> they all live in a situation that they did not create and they did not ask for. Mm-hmm. And you're expecting them to be okay with it. And they're not okay. And yeah. I know that feeling because I was in that situation. Mm. Living in a situation that I did not ask for and I did not create. You brought me here. <laughs> so yeah. I'm you know, somebody help me. Somebody mm. there for me, type of deal. Uh-oh. That's that's a haunting line. Somebody help me. Wow, <laughs> that's just that's it right there. So, you, you know, I'm sure there's been ways, you know, through the years now, your journey, then fostering, and then adoption, that really has grown you personally in ways. And speak a little to that. Like, what? How have you grown from this, and what has it taught you, even about yourself? Well, you know. I will say, honestly, my family growing up, we weren't a very affectionate group of people. And one thing I know for sure that my older son taught me was what genuine love from someone that is around you every day feels like. And the the hugs and the I love yous and the thoughtful gifts for no reason and the, 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 the just the bonding of it all. It was so different for me that I, something I did not experience growing up. And I, you know, once he was showing me what he needed and how he, his love language of how he liked to be treated. I mean, the, he was so simple, but it was like the simple things made him happy. And I was like, but this kid, like, and I said this about all of my boys. I'm like, who wouldn't want to wake up to this space right here? Like, how could you walk away from this? Mm-hmm. Why wouldn't you want to be around to capture these moments with this sweet child, you know, mm. this, and he was just the sweetest kid. I couldn't understand who would want to leave him behind anywhere. And mm. that's when I knew I was like, I, I just have to be like the best father to this kid. He's so, he deserves it so much, you know, mm. and I wanted to be the father I wish I had, you know, and I mm. think I did a pretty good job of that. He's 22 now, but he's going, moving on and going. He's 23 uh-huh. now, but he does, you know, express. He was like, you know, I'm so glad I have, I have you, mm. you know, and things like that. And that just makes me feel good too. And it just, it just taught me how to love and what what love from a parent should look like and what love mm. from a child should look like. And I just, you know, that that part. I don't think you could have taught that in any training or anything like that. That. Mm. Was, it happened so organically and it was just over time, the milestones and watching and being happy and being mad. <laughs> right. But it was just like the everyday parenting things that people, you know, some people have just taken for granted. Like mm. from when you walk away from these kids, it's like you, you look at them and those, and then you look at old pictures. Like I look at old pictures of my kids now, I'm like, Oh, my babies, like they're, just, they're gone. but it takes me back to that moment of gosh i really love these kids like Mm. every 
My whole world revolved around him. Even in my 20s, my whole world revolved around him because I loved every minute of it. Mm. That's so well said, so inspiring, and yeah, the lessons of life. Yeah, and it just reminds me too, a lot of people think they have to have it all together or know so much about parenting to step mm-hmm. into this. And like my husband, he grew up in an extremely abusive home. So mm-hmm. he didn't know what it was like to have a healthy father mm-hmm. and how much he's been able to shift, you know, and turn that around, <clears throat> right. you know, get his healing first for mm-hmm. the most part, and then enter this realm and and even be able to connect with the kids too, which I'm sure you have experiences right. too, where you could just connect with them differently mm-hmm. than, than maybe me who grew up just in a pretty yeah. healthy, comfortable lifestyle. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yeah, no, that that's well said. That makes a lot of sense too. To have that grown compassion from experience to to even be more sensitive to look and lean in. Mm-hmm. Yeah, so true. Well, tell us Barry more about the Barry Farmer Morning Show. Some of your other creative work. Take us kind of into your world of all that you're involved with, which is so much cool stuff. Oh gosh, well, this show was created in my mind one day. <laughs> <I was> like, <laughs> okay, I think I want to do radio. I'm pretty fun. And for the most part, like I'm not just the black guy that I, that adopted white kids. I am actually funny. I like talking to people. <laughs> <laughs> I can do th- other things, you know. Um, and a lot of people thought that it would have been a, a radio show about foster care and whatnot. No, it's a morning show. We get to talk about anything and everything. We are the goofiest bunch of people that you probably would run into while behind a microphone. <laughs> Along with the others that do morning shows across the country, because that's what you have to have in the morning, somebody to wake you up and make you laugh and things <laughs> right. like that. So, you know, this show started very um, humble. You know, we, we, it was just me and one of my co-hosts, Sharon, at one time. And we actually used to do the show from her kitchen table back in 2019. And we we sounded horrible. Like I was like, we sound crappy. <laughs> but it's one of those things you had to keep working at. We finally got a, a station to give us a shot at being on every day. And then um, a few months after that, we decided to send our demos out to a few other stations, and they decided to pick us up as well. And now we're five years in. We're celebrating five years um, this year with a nice little anniversary party or whatnot. And, you know, the show is just about everything. We talk about everything under the sun. You know, we try to be family friendly as much as we can. Mm. (laughs) (laughs) Um, (laughs) But it's more about friends sitting around the table just chatting. Mm. Then we have guests that come in and they don't know what to do with us. They're like, oh, my God, what just happened? (laughs) (laughs) You know, and it's it's more of a, you know, being there for the community. We show up a lot in the community here in Richmond. Um, like I said, just even for me reaching out to uh, Virginia Kids Belong and say, hey, I got an idea. You want to hear about it mm. <laughs> real quick? You know, just to, you know, mm. make sure that we are community involved and we're not just sitting here in our studios just thinking of goofy things to say, but that we're <laughs> actually getting out there in the community and saying in the and saying goofy things in the community and <laughs> just doing <laughs> our part and making sure that we are highlighting different things. Not only do we highlight foster care, we highlight every year um, sickle cell awareness. We highlight every year um, single parent um, awareness and bringing um, them into spaces where they can get the resources that they need by partnering with other nonprofits in the area. Um, so you know we. We pride ourselves on that. We're not just a one-trick pony that can turn on the microphone and say, hey, 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 hey. Uh-huh. but we, we do things that are like meaningful to us and the community. Anything else you want to say about any of the resources kind of that you're also working on for or doing with awareness around foster adoption? What, um, so for right now, I think I'm on my speaking trip right now. I'm just going from place to place and sharing being that advocate um, to share more about adopting older kids that are ages probably six and up. Cool. Um, I'm also um, still have, I also still have the group, the foster care adoption Mm -hmm. talk um, group. And, you know, people, I started that a few years ago and it was just for some of us to come together and just vent a little bit and share because not everyone around us know, understands what's going on. You know, they'll give us a good old, yeah, good job, good going, you know, type of thing. But, 
you know, when you're really in the meat of things and you need a little support, I think a group like that, along with that other groups, but I felt like our group was like more, it's like the way it gets, we're kind of goofy. We just share different things and talk about different placements and things like that. So, you know, it's, that's probably one of the resources I'm glad I, I made. And that was like years ago. But other than that, I'm just, I guess I'm on my speaking trail right now. Mm-hmm. Just trying to spread that word about kids waiting for um, adoption and foster care. Very cool. Yeah. So is there any, like one website where listeners can follow you or obviously we can put links to the radio show and then any of these other, like the support community Absolutely. So like, as I say on my show, if you're looking for me, you can find me on Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter at I am Barry Farmer. And you can get extra dose. You can always visit BarryFarmer.com. Very good. Cool. Love it. Yeah, <laughs> you've got it down. <laughs> <laughs> well, thank you for joining us today. This has Absolutely. been, you are fun. So oh, yeah. thank you. It's good. See, yeah, I mean, I've been trying to tell people. <laughs> I mean, I feel like when you say you're fun, you have to deliver because yeah. there's some pressure. That, and you delivered. I mean, you backed it up. You were fun. This was a lot of fun. Yeah. Absolutely. Thank you. Thanks for being on today. No problem. Anytime. We hope you enjoyed today's episode. If so, will you help us reach more people by subscribing, sharing the podcast with a friend, and leaving a five star review? If you've been inspired by what you've heard today and want to learn more of how you can make a difference for kids in foster care and the foster families where you live, visit americaskidsbelong.org. We depend on individual donors to fund our work. We'd be grateful if you would consider joining us as a monthly donor. Visit americaskidsbelong.org to make your tax-deductible donation. Thank you. Together, we can ensure a family for every child in foster care and a foster-friendly community to ensure every foster family feels loved and supported.